Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, session of Reading Comprehension, How to Master It. It's a pleasure to have you all here with us today, and I would like to start by turning on my presentation. So let's share the presentation, and we are ready to go. Okay. Okay, so let's turn this into full screen, and here we go. All right, everyone. So uh, welcome once again to this conference. It's the 14th conference in the row, and it's a pleasure to have you all here. My name is Catherine, and we'll be delving into, you know, reading comprehension and various techniques into mastering it. Now, a few things about myself. I am an ELT teacher. I've been teaching for the past 19 years. <laughs> Very proud of that. I'm also an ELT oral examiner and coordinator for the majority of universities, which certify and evaluate students in the use of English language. I'm an author. I work for an international ELT publisher, and I've authored a total of 25 books that have to do with ELT training, ICT, as well as children's readers and novels. Uh, I'm also a teacher trainer for international as well as domestic conferences. And uh, finally, I'm a TEDx speaker and TED organizer, as I help set up, you know, various uh, clubs at schools for children to participate and become TED speakers. Okay, so before beginning this presentation, because this is going to be a long one, we're talking about 50 minutes, uh, it's a good idea to look at the contents about what we're going to be discussing. So first of all, uh, we will delve into the question of what is reading comprehension, why it is important, why do students have difficulties in tackling reading comprehension? As well as acknowledging the problem, because many times, you know, uh, students who might ace tests who are good at grammar, vocabulary, might not be, you know, uh, good at, you know, reading comprehension. And this sometimes eludes us. Now, we'll also be examining why do teachers focus more on other skills? Hmm. How can both teachers and students overcome this fear? Because, you know, all of us have, are scared, you know, of tackling this skill, this skill. And, you know, in many cases, uh, you can probably, you know, see that, you know, a kid had a really good score in grammar, in vocabulary. Oh, no, reading comprehension isn't that good. So they just drop it or they even remove it from tests. Now, uh, integrating reading comprehension to the lesson is some of the things that we'll be doing during this uh, training. Best approaches in doing this. We will also be proposing reading to boost their skills as well as their self-esteem with a lot of examples. And finally, we will uh, be looking into exam techniques. Now, before beginning, I want to stress something. The purpose of learning the English language is to learn it, okay? Not to go sit for an exam. Yes, that's an ultimate goal, okay? We are all teachers. We all want our kids to succeed and pass their final examinations. However, this shouldn't be our main goal, okay? Our main goal is learning the English language. However, we will be looking at exam techniques as well. Okay, so the first question that pops to mind, what is reading comprehension? It's not as simple as, okay, reading a text and answering questions, it's not that simple. Okay, reading is a crucial skill which helps us understand the main meaning of a text as well as the general ideas an author tries to convey. Now, this crucial skill is an essential one as our brain literally processes a multitude of information. Now, our brain when we're reading something, be it a blog or a newspaper or text in a course book, we process the meaning of the words in the text. And you know what, even adults, okay, who might be reading a newspaper, there's uh, no way we can know all the vocabulary that is used on the page. But the whole idea is to comprehend what you're reading. Okay, that's reading comprehension. We will examine, uh, of course, how they are connected to each other. And that's the whole purpose of reading comprehension. That's how it works the level of the language, and of course, the emotional impact it has on us, okay? And, you know, this is what reading comprehension is about. And these are the four elements, the four aspects that we have to, you know, focus on. Now, all of these factors convey a coherent sum of ideas to the reader. Now, why is reading comprehension important? Is it because we want our kids to pass their exams? Yes, but th that's not the main reason. Okay, first of all, fostering the ability to understand what we are reading is important in our everyday lives. Okay, we have text, we read stuff every day. We have to understand what we're reading. The interpretation of thoughts and ideas, okay, because our brain interprets all of these, you know, texts, these words, and you know, 
we have to understand what the author is trying to convey. We definitely expand our vocabulary in ways we couldn't imagine because, you know, it's not only translating, you know, words because I'm not in favor of that, but understanding the use, the meaning of a word in a sentence, in a paragraph is the best way to learn a language. And this can be done through reading comprehension. We'll uh, see this uh, further down the presentation. Of course, reading comprehension is informative. You're reading a text, you learn things. It's entertaining, it should be entertaining. And if some texts are boring, we'll talk about this later. Now, some final um, things that we have to mention about the importance of reading comprehension. It does broaden your students' horizons. It expands their imagination, leading to creativity. This is what we want because a student, a child, an adult who is learning a language, we want him to broaden his horizons, expand his vocabulary, and you know what? By mastering reading comprehension, they will become more efficient at speaking and definitely more efficient at writing. And this is what we want. And of course, it will boost our self-esteem if we are capable of you know, comprehending what we are reading. Finally, it goes without saying that you know, we are building you know, the society of tomorrow. We are helping our kids you know, become adults and you know, becoming actor, active citizens. And um, if they are not capable of reading texts, work manuals, information seats, emails, it will be difficult for them. So it falls upon us to help them succeed in life. Now, why do students find reading comprehension difficult? Well, comprehension relies on decoding a text. If a student is not capable of decoding a text, then he, you know, he or she has issues. Now, one of the main problems is that students don't remember everything. And you know what? That's the problem. They don't have to remember everything, but students try to you know, rote learn and learn things by heart. We'll get into that soon. Some kids have limited vocabulary. Yes, teachers, you know, pass on, you know, vocabulary, group vocabulary, and they're like, you have to learn this by heart. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not against learning vocabulary, but translating every word from a reading comprehension text, you just lose the point of reading, okay? Because you have to comprehend something that you have never seen before, okay? Students many times show little to no interest. And yes, I mean, there are a lot of texts that are boring. I'm, I'm serious, okay? I'm just getting it out. And we have to try to motivate them. There's a lot of stress or anxiety in class. And yes, this falls on us as well to try to motivate them and inspire them not to be that stressed. There might be a learning disability because um, there are a lot of kids that rely on their you know, listening skills or speaking skills. Each and every one of us are unique as snowflakes. And the thing is that we can't excel at all skills, okay? Some are better at writing, some are better at speaking. However, you know, when we're reading you know, something, uh, sometimes we have difficulty grasping the meaning. And um, it might have to do, you know, with phonological awareness. And, you know, that's one of the main reasons that course books always have an audio file that accompanies the reading comprehension. And I highly urge, you know, teachers to play this file, you know, to better, you know, help the students in understanding what they're reading. Intonation, things like, you know, stress, word stress, they're all important. Now, I have to admit, it's also our own fault because we often treat reading exclusively as an exam. Yes, I mentioned this earlier. Our ultimate goal is, you know, for our final goal is for kids, you know, to sit for exams. But we forget that kids are learning a foreign language. We have to help them learn. We're not supposed to prepare them for exams, not yet at least, okay? And we tend to translate words, as I mentioned earlier, and phrases for them. For example, here's a sentence, okay? This remedy works wonders. And you know, you can translate remedy, you can translate wonders. However, some of the essence, you know, of this sentence gets lost in the translation. So kids have to hear it. They have to experience it firsthand, you know, by themselves to understand, you know, comprehension. Now, grammar and structure is often neglected. Let's look at this sentence. It's a cleft sentence. We stress um, specific things and it starts by it was the sudden noise that scared me. Now, we're not stressing the fact that he's scared. We're stressing the sudden noise, okay? And we'll look into these techniques soon. And all of these little things, all these little details, grammar, structure, combinations, phrases, 
metaphors, all of these together combined, you know, will help the student, you know, comprehend the text better. Now, how do we know that a student is facing difficulties with reading comprehension? That's a good question. Now, if you can, you know, uh, witness your student who has an inability in providing a summary for a text, focusing only on a specific segment on it. Now, you can ask your kids, give me a summary, a very short one, 30, 40 words of what you've just read. If they're having problems, then yes, that's a sign that they have to, you know, boost and foster, you know, their reading comprehension skills. Now, sometimes they're unable to decipher feelings, thoughts, or ideas conveyed by the writer and characters. Ask them after they have read a reading comprehension. How do you think the author feels? What about the main character? If they're having difficulty, you know, expressing their thoughts, their ideas, or generally understanding what's happened, yes, they have, you know, difficulties with reading comprehension. Now, you might say, but my student, you know, is perfect at grammar and vocabulary. And yes, many times they even remove the reading comprehension, you know, um, segment of the test in order to get the perfect score. But that's a mistake. Reading comprehension is one of the most crucial parts of learning a language. Now, a student may be able to comprehend the main idea, okay, we're getting better here, of a text, but can't delve into details. Key elements and facts are lost, which is a main issue in exam evaluations. Hmm. Okay, we'll look into some techniques. Now, educators unintentionally or even intentionally avoid a simplified reading comprehension. That's a huge no-no. I mean, as educators, please do not make the reading more simple. And, you know, I know that you don't want to disappoint your kids, but sometimes they have to realize a few things. Let me explain. First of all, we are all teachers. We are all under constant stress because we don't have that much time to uh, deliver the ELT material at our disposal, the syllabus, the books. Parents pay for the books. And, you know, the school manager, the school owner, the principal, they want us to complete the books, you know, by the end of the year. I respect that. It's totally, you know, uh, logical because, you know, school um, owners and, you know, principals, they are also under constant pressure by the parents. However, we should draw the line somewhere. It's better to do 11 out of 12 units by the end of the school year instead of 12 out of 12 by skipping things like reading comprehension and having your kids not understand, you know, some aspects of the book because we want them to fully acknowledge and understand what they have learned. Now, Students comprehend reading in various ways. Some kids, you know, will understand the main idea. Some will be better at, you know, analyzing the vocabulary. Some will, you know, uh, study the reading comprehension by keeping notes. Others can focus on notes. We'll look at this soon. Now, another mistake that most teachers have, you know, done this. It's not that I'm, you know, reprimanding everyone. It's just that we have to be very careful. Predefining content is the, the biggest mistake that an educator can make. Let me explain something here. Let's say, for example, that you're going to read something about an astronaut who was in danger and got lost in space. Okay, so the teacher starts by saying, okay, guys, we're going to read something about an astronaut who got lost in space, but he made it back home and he saved himself. And, you know, that's predefining content. And, you know, it's what we call spoilers. You know, you actually give away everything. It's like giving away the plot of a movie. The problem is that, you know, by giving away, you know, um, the main plot of a reading, kids are not interested. They're bored. You're not, you know, keeping them, you know, in suspense. Secondly, they're not developing their critical thought because a child will start thinking, hmm, how can he escape? Where is he? What means will he use to return back to Earth? So you're actually destroying the child's critical thought. A good technique is to say that we will be talking about an astronaut who got lost in space. Okay, and that's where you stop. What do you guys know about astronauts? Have them think. How do you think that someone could get lost in space? Do you think that space is dangerous? This is what we want. We want to develop their critical thought. Then we're going to read the text. But don't give away spoilers, predefining content. So another thing that, you know, teachers do is that, you know, there are easy to comprehend texts that they use. So let's say that they're putting together a text, grammar, vocabulary, listening, and they put an easy reading for them, you know, to score, you know, to have a really good score. 
to avoid miscomprehension, but that's a mistake. If they don't get tested, you know, with reading comprehension that is at their level, I'm not saying more difficult, then there's no point in, you know, having them develop their critical thought or, you know, putting them through, you know, this trial. Now, we are scared, students are scared, how to face this. Our stance may positively or negatively affect our students. What do we mean by this? If you open your course books, come on, guys, we have to do a really boring uh, reading comprehension, and it has to do about, let's say, penguins. And, you know, the kids are going to be, oh, no. And if they see the teacher board, okay, I mean, how do you think they will react? Try to hype the lesson up. Okay. For example, let's say that we have a reading comprehension about, I don't know, Italy and food. Have you guys ever been to Italy? Hmm, what's your favorite food? Where else would you like to travel? Try to stimulate their minds, okay? Make something that is boring or tedious, make it, you know, more inspiring. Try to have them, you know, participate. And, you know, adopt familiar topics and themes, things that they like. Kids, what would you like to talk about today? I have this beautiful reading, which is like a very short text about social media or about superheroes, anything. Cooperation is key, not competition. And this has to do not only between the teacher and, you know, the students, but between, you know, the students as well. During, you know, uh, class, doing reading comprehension, you might have a debate or you might have them, you know, discuss their thoughts on the reading comprehension. Do not blindly tell them, read the reading comprehension and do the exercises. No, we want the interaction. We want kids to share their ideas first. And the whole purpose is to remove any unnecessary anxiety from the ELT environment. This is our goal. We're teachers. We have to control the situation. I'm not saying we're psychologists, but more or less we're psychologists, we're parents, we're everything. <laughs> and of course, applaud their efforts, encourage them along the way, because we want them to be happy. We want them to think positively and, you know, boost their self-esteem. And students will reciprocate and make our lives easier. If they see that we're trying, they're going to try as well. And you know what? I mean, I've been doing this my whole life. Just listen to the experts. The only way to train students to become better language learners is accomplished by helping students deal with and overcome their feelings of anxiety. Stated by Young in 1999. Students feel anxious only after ongoing negative experiences in the language learning environment. Stated by McIntyre and Gardner in 1989. Now, how do we integrate reading comprehension into the lesson? Well, you dedicate time from every lesson to reading. Okay, I mean, that's the most important thing. First of all, let me explain something. I know that we have to complete the specific, you know, delivery of lesson, the ELT syllabus. Yes, they have a gun to our head. You have to finish the book. However, it's not a problem to dedicate two, three minutes at the end of the lesson to reading something. Read them a very short story read them a reading comprehension that is 150 words. That's not a problem, trust me. Before starting, have them make predictions based on limited info, show them a picture, the title. Okay, because a lot of kids um, rely on images, audio, and you know, by combining all of these, you know, um, stimuli, they can actually, you know, um, produce better work. Read to the students with proper intonation and expressiveness. I do reading comprehension with my junior classes. I read them a book. For example, I, I read them fairy tales all the time. And I try to use the proper intonation, even if it's a story like, you know, The Three Little Pigs. And I try to be scared. I try to do the big bad wolf, and, you know, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. And, you know, all of these things contribute to stimulating, you know, the child's mind. And of course, have them follow suit. And what do I mean by this? Have them read afterwards using the same intonation. Hmm. Start with small, albeit interesting texts. Okay, we don't want to overdo it and, you know, have them overwhelmed. And have the students share their thoughts. Okay, what do you think about the story? How do you feel? Now, let's talk about the best approaches into dealing with reading comprehension. Okay, now we're getting into further, you know, um, grounds that have to do with, you know, doing exercises, examination techniques. First of all, skim the text, search for clues, look at the title. Look at the section heading, a topic sentence, the first you know, sentence of a paragraph. Now, 
you don't have to go through it linearly. I mean, you don't have to go through the whole thing. Each person has a different way of tackling reading comprehension. Go through upcoming sections, skip backwards or reread it. Okay, there's not a specific rule into doing this. Take your time with taking the text apart. And of course, I have to stress that as many times as possible, our brains do not work in the same manner. You can't expect everyone to think the same way as you do. I mean, it's impossible. And um, many times, you know, kids, uh, you can see that one kid, you know, is underlining everything. The other one is, you know, fiddling with his pencil. Um, others are trying to concentrate. Every person has a different approach to reading comprehension. Now, um, I have this animated GIF here, which is, you know, moving up and down. <laughs> And, you know, I did this on purpose because it is distracting. Look at it. Okay. Now, I don't know if you're paying attention to me or the speaker right now. When in class, it's sometimes difficult to concentrate. I know you're looking at the speaker right now. Now, there's a difference between reading various texts, social media posts versus a university article. If we're listening to music at our homes or, you know, you're out at a cafe and you're fiddling with your phone and you're going through social media, you can, you know, concentrate. But if it's a university article, an exam test, anything, little distractions can completely destroy us. And I, I mean this. So, for example, in one of my classes, I have one of my students who is constantly fiddling with his, with his pen, you know, while reading a text. Another one of my students is looking at the pen. And, you know, it's not the student's fault that is looking at the pen, but, you know, it does distract, you know, each other. And I'm probably sure that the speaker is still distracting you. Now, the thing is that um, if possible, try to switch, you know, the seats of the students in class. Do not have them, you know, look at the person that is distracting them. A better approach would be to have, you know, separate classrooms, but I understand it's difficult. There's not a lot of space in schools and you need someone to supervise them while they do these tasks. Now, uh, Keeping notes. Okay. Now, I have to stress something. There are some exams that I do not recommend to take notes. I can't name these universities, but the universities that have very limited time into um, finishing, you know, your test, you don't have that much time to take notes, unfortunately. Now, is taking notes uh, a good approach? Of course, I'm in favor of notes. Now, essential plot points or main ideas should be, you know, written down. It does help a lot. You can go through them at any later time, you know, to remind yourself of what you have read. And it leads to a more cohesive interpretation of the whole text. And this is what we want. Okay, keep little bits of notes, the most essential, you know, plot details, the points of the text. Go back. Read them again. We're not all of us good at rote learning, at memory retention. I'm not good at it. So I always take notes of everything I read or do. Now, critical thinking. I've already touched upon this topic earlier. Critical thinking. Now, I am in favor of critical thinking. It's impossible to have a new generation of people who are the citizens, the cornerstones, you know, of society and not have them be able to think critically for themselves and make rational decisions. Now, students should be thinking while they're reading rather than reading continuously. You know, many times we tell our kids, come on, read the text. Don't have your mind wander. Has it ever occurred to you that the kid is thinking about what he just read? So the whole idea is to let them think. They reach, you know, one or two lines. They want to pause and, you know, ponder on it. That's good. Let them think about it. They should stop when confused. Think about what they have just read and seek the answers to their questions in the material they haven't read yet. Okay. Now, knowing your limits, knowing your students' limits, just stop if you get confused or tired. I mean, we're not machines. I can't, you know, um, continuously work on my books when I'm writing a book sometimes. After four or five hours, I'm like, I can't take it anymore. We just stop and have a break. The same thing applies for reading comprehension. If, for example, you see a kid, you know, holding his head or, you know, exhaling, you know, heavily, it's time for him to have a break. I'm serious. Okay. You can kindly ask them, you know, to get up, you know, go out of the room, go to the bathroom, drink some water, and then come back. This one minute break, even less than a minute, will do wonders for the student. 
If he doesn't do something like this by continuing, our interpretation of the text is not solid and will lead to wrong conclusions. By forcing them to continue, they will make many mistakes. Now, tests require a different approach. Okay, I mentioned earlier that there are some tests with limited time, and you know, you have to tackle those in a different fashion. Okay, we'll see that at, you know, further down during the presentation. Now, visualizing a text, bringing words to life. I love this part. Your imagination, your minds are capable of wondrous things. By reading a sentence, our mind will process the information and will then suddenly, you know, create images in our minds. This is so important. Now, besides bringing words to life, we create mental images. And, you know, something that can help us, we can also examine the text photos. I mean, yes, it makes the course book happier, more colorful, more entertaining to have, you know, pictures next to the reading text. But it's not its only purpose. Did, I don't know if you're aware, but, you know, all ELT publishers try to, you know, use pictures that are, you know, um, connected to the text, all right, that have some kind of correlation to it. And, you know, this will further stimulate, you know, students' minds. Now, studying the captions is also another uh, technique that is very important. Let your kids wander around on the page, you know, let them, you know, examine and search what they can find around the reading comprehension text. All of these little things can stimulate their minds and better help them process the information they have at their disposal. Some minds intricately connect images to ideas. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, assigning summaries. No, we're not punishing them. No, it's not extra homework. Actually, they're doing less homework. Now, summaries. Let's say that you have a text. It's about 150 words. And you want to tell your kids to do a summary at home. Ask them to do a short one, 30, 40 words. What do they gain by this? First of all, um, these summaries will help them at home understand the text better by writing down their ideas. Secondly, they can use this information for a presentation in class. Have them transfer these ideas from the reading comprehension to do the speaking, practice their speaking you know, techniques, and of course, this will then lead to a wonderful debate in class after they've done their presentation. Okay, so all of these skills are intricately connected to one another, and it's a good idea to have summaries in class. They can also do a PowerPoint presentation along with a summary. The presentation doesn't have to be more than two minutes, okay? One minute, two minutes, and then, you know, you can ask for feedback from the audience, referring to the rest of the students in class. Now, as for best approaches, reading should be fun. Okay, if you think that your kids are not enjoying what they're reading, just find something else to read. Now, first of all, we have to get this out of the way. Some people don't enjoy reading, okay? We can't force them to enjoy reading. However, reading has many options and forms, okay? We have to stress this as much as possible. Don't limit their preferences and offer them alternatives. If, for example, you know, some of your kids say, I. I, I don't like, you know, the reading comprehension in the course book, or um, I don't like, you know, reading um, specific articles online. Give them a graphic novel. Give them a comic. Let them read things that they're interested in. Articles about, you know, their favorite games, superheroes, right? There is so many things that they can use. Speaking of which, what I just mentioned, short readers. There are so many readers, you know, available from many publishers with varied levels and you know what? Maybe one publisher is not something that your kids like. Try another one. And you know, I think that the most important thing is to ask the student's opinion. I'm literally proposing that you show them the catalog of the books that you can order. Show them the catalog and have them choose which books that you know um, they'd like you to order. And they will appreciate it and they will read them even if they don't like them. But the whole fact is that since they chose the book, they'll make an effort. And you know what? Usually, most of the times, 90, 95% they'll love the books. Now, try to choose um, graphic novels, comics. It's, it's in fashion, okay? And, you know, it's the latest trend. Kids like, you know, graphic novels. Blogs, online articles. Ask them what kind of topics are of interest to you. Do your research. Find uh, blogs that use the proper language for the level and then propose specific websites for your kids to read. 
Reading should be fun. Inspire them to read. And of course, integrate them with class presentations. What I said earlier, have them read the book, the reader that they chose. Have them do a presentation in class with a PowerPoint, without one, it doesn't matter. Have them speak to the class. Everyone, I just read this book. And, you know, without giving, you know, many spoilers away, I want to talk to you about, you know, the feelings I had after reading this. And you know what? This is the whole purpose of reading, to share knowledge, share information, inspire others to read as well. Now, I'm going to share with you a little comic strip. When I was growing up, I loved Charlie Brown and Snoopy and the franchise called Peanuts. And, you know, I remember my father, he used to bring, you know, a newspaper every day at home. And it had, you know, two comic strips. One was Peanuts and the other one was with Spider-Man. And I really loved, you know, um, comic strips. I learned a lot of things from that, you know, especially vocabulary. Now, allow me to read this and I'll blow your minds with what you're going to process. I think I'll ask the teacher if I can move my desk next to that little redhead haired girl. Then one day I can reach over and touch her hand and she can look at me like I've lost my mind. Maybe I'll ask the teacher if I can move my desk out into the hallway. <laughs> Poor Charlie Brown and that red haired girl. Okay, now, what have we gained from a simple comic strip of four panels, prepositions, idioms, Vocabulary, here's the verbs entertainment. Where are they? Let me begin. Prepositions, look at the last panel. Move my desk out into the hallway. Idioms, I've lost my mind. It's in the third panel. Vocabulary, maybe they don't know what a hallway is. You always find vocabulary. Phrasal verbs, we can say reach over. All right, it's in the second panel. And of course, entertainment. Okay, Charlie Brown always puts a smile on my face. So you can understand that a simple comic strip can, you know, do wonders for a kid. This is a comic strip that took us 20 seconds to read, and it had uh, five forms that we are interested in, that we're invested in as teachers. It's amazing. As for vocabulary, now, all right, there's a vast misconception that it will lead to improving reading comprehension skills. Yes, teachers, you know, organize group vocabulary. They pass on vocabulary. Learn these 40 words by heart. Okay, it does help up to a point, but you know, learning what a word means doesn't mean that you know how to use it in a sentence or you don't know what it means when in a sentence. A word can have a different interpretation, you know, outside a sentence rather than in it. So vocabulary will only get you so far because they're idioms, metaphors, intonation, exclamation marks. I mean, there's so many things. It's not only about vocabulary. However, practice makes perfect and frequent reading is key. All right, the more we read, the better we become at it. Don't depend on blunt memorization of the words, okay? Because I keep stressing this, it's not gonna lead you anywhere. Let's look at this example. Where are my keys? I can't find them anywhere, Josh said as he frantically searched the room. Beats me, Mary replied as she shrugged her shoulders, unaware where Josh had left them. Now, the key expression here is beats me. Some kids might know it. Most of them probably won't at this level. Mary replied as she shrugged her shoulders. So kids don't know what shrug means. Unaware. So the whole idea is for kids to start connecting words in the text from the upper part, the lower part, in between. Unaware. Shrugged. Hmm. Maybe they're connected. We see that Josh, at the beginning of this paragraph, says that he's looking for something. So what does shrug, shoulders, what do we do with our shoulders? The kids start thinking, critical thinking, they're developing their critical thought, shrug. Probably, I don't know. Okay, so even though they've never seen this word in their lives, they probably understand what it means. Therefore, they'll connect it to beats me, which probably is a metaphor for, I don't know. Now, if we were to take the other road, and start literally explaining the word beat means win, okay? Beat means hit. You can beat the eggs or the boy was beaten by some bullies. Beat is also a type of vegetable. What exactly do you want your kids to learn by heart? Hmm. It won't lead you, you know, to the solution every time. Because in this case, beats me is a metaphorical use for don't know. Okay, now let's move on. 
focus on grammar and structure. It's not just about vocabulary. Clet sentences. I love clet sentences. Exclamation marks. Adjectives. Adjectives play a huge role in reading comprehension. An author will use adjectives when he wants to stress something. Look out for adjectives because usually we want you know to inspire readers as an author myself i use a lot of adjectives and try you know to get you know the reader to feel what i'm feeling conditionals inversions these are used a lot in exams we have hypothetical sentences and you know they usually test these a lot if your students see things like unless or provided that and you know all these conditional linking words have them suspect something suspicious that there are two scenarios here formal or informal address is the text a scientific one a historical one satire what is it is it a story is it funny students must be able to understand this from the start okay we want them to open their minds and you know try to comprehend what they are reading now let's look at an example i mentioned earlier cleft sentences the vase or the vase was broken by william okay the vase was broken by William. We are stressing what was broken. It's at the beginning of the sentence. It was William who broke the vase. This is another cleft sentence and we've switched, you know, um, the object and the subject. So we are stressing on who broke it, William in this case. Cleft sentences play a huge role. Intonation and so many other structures, you know, it's not about vocabulary. I'll keep stressing this. Now, deciphering a text, let's try something a bit more harder. Now, allow me to use something from one of my books. I've written a children's novel. It's a trilogy of books called The Adventures of Ben and Friday, and it's like um, a science fiction, you know, reader in space. And I wanted to share with you two paragraphs so you can see how we can decipher a reading comprehension text. Allow me to read this. The planet Serpo was inhabited by one of the most advanced alien civilizations in the universe, populated by an intelligent species of aliens. Their technological advances knew no limits. They had created a peaceful society which prospered and stood as a beacon throughout the universe of what any culture could achieve if not affected by wars or hate. Serpo had many visitors from worlds both remote and near. Cultural and technological exchange was always welcome there. Representatives from Earth had the honor of being invited to witness firsthand the wonders of this unique world. Okay, having read this now, let's say that your students had this text in front of them. There are so many unknown words. There are things that they will have difficulty comprehending. How can we help them understand the text better? Underlining a few things is a good idea, okay? Trying to connect words in the text will help a lot. Let's see a few examples. I'll keep the text on the screen so that you can, you know, um, watch as I further go down. Okay, first of all, authors usually have this tendency to use a lot of synonyms so we don't become repetitive. We don't want our language in our books when we're writing to be boring, so we use synonyms. Tell this to your students, okay. So they might know what populated means, but they probably don't know what inhabited means, but they have read it, you know, um, one after the other. So they underline inhabited by one of the most advanced alien civilizations, Populated, okay. So they're trying to connect the dots and they're probably establishing the fact that inhabited probably means the same thing as populated. Now, intelligence, technological advances, these things go together. If you're intelligent, you can, you know, produce technology, all right? So you get an idea that these guys are really advanced, okay? And, you know, it's really high tech. They get this emotion, this idea that we're talking about something that is way more advanced. Peaceful society which prospered, a peaceful society. Okay, they know what peaceful is. They don't know what prosper is, but it's a peaceful society. When there's peace, good things happen. So they prospered. They don't know what prosper means, but they get the feeling that it's something good, that things are going well. Remember, they can't know all the words, but they're understanding the meaning. What any culture could achieve if 
We have the magic word, we have a conditional here, not affected by wars or hate. So they can do a lot of things because they don't have wars. All right, we're getting the meaning. Now, sometimes they might not know two opposite words. They might know what near means because they've learned the prepositions, but they don't know what remote means. But since they're contrasting the two words here, okay, I know what near means. So remote means far away. I got it. And finally, we have representatives from Earth. Maybe they don't know what representative is, but it's from Earth, so something is coming from Earth. Had the honor, okay, who had the honor? Probably people of being invited to witness firsthand. Oh, witness firsthand. They probably don't know what this is, but they're going to see something probably firsthand. They're the first to see it, maybe, or, you know, hand. Oh, they're going to touch something, or maybe they're trying to interpret the whole meaning of the text. Okay, the wonders of this unique world. All right. Now, the last thing in the text, wonders of this world, wonders of this unique world. Since they probably know what wonder is, but they don't know unique, they make the connection. Okay, now I know what you're probably thinking. What about the exams? Yes. This is something that is a burden on everyone's shoulders. I'm a teacher. I have nine to 10 classes per year. I have B2 levels, C1s, C2s. I have everything. It is difficult because after so many years of preparing your kids, you want them to succeed. I understand that. However, if you don't follow you know, um, these proposals and have them love reading comprehension and work on it more you know, efficiently in class, it's difficult, if not impossible, to do so for exams. Let's start with exams. Now, these are the easy tips. First of all, go through the questions first, then the passage, but avoid the answers. I'm going to let you process this. Questions first, read the passage, don't read the answers. Why? Because if you read the questions along with the answers, then our mind will lock on the answers and we'll try to find the answers in the text. Do not do this. Read the questions, try to find the answers in the passage. If you think you found the answer, then go back you know, to answer the questions when we're talking about multiple choice. Isolate the most important elements. I said this before, headings, topic sentences, topic sentence, the first sentence of each paragraph, underline it or circle it or anything. What is the main gist of this paragraph? Okay, what is he trying to convey here? Don't memorize, analyze the flow. Guys, these kids have a limited time. They don't have much time to do the reading comprehension during a test. Let them analyze the flow. Tell your kids, don't learn it by heart. Just try to get the main meaning of it. Get the gist, not the vocabulary. Don't focus exclusively on difficult words because there are a lot of words that you know. If you spend two or three minutes try to ponder, pondering on what a word means, you won't ma manage you know, to finish the test in time, unfortunately. Now, avoid the passage that you're having difficulty with, all right? If, for example, you have three reading comprehensions in a test and you know, you're running out of time and you're definitely sure that one is really difficult, you can't understand it, go to the other two. Leave it for last. Avoid the passage that you're having difficulty with. It's a shame to lose, for example, 10 points from two easy texts by working on one passage with five you know, difficult questions. Of course, your teachers are going to know this. These are the easy tips. Let's go to something more complex. What else should we consider? The main idea of a passage is usually found in the first or last paragraph. Hmm. OK, so by examining the first and last paragraph, you usually get the main idea. This is not always the case, but it usually is. Don't rely on contrasting vocabulary, but however, Sometimes kids read a whole passage and at the end there's a but or however or regardless or nevertheless. And they're like, oh my God, so the answer is after the contrasting vocabulary. No. The author developed a whole article for the kid to read. Tell your students not to, dis to disregard, you know, everything that came before that, okay? It's a trap. I'm not saying that the answer is not after, you know, the contrasting vocabulary, but it's a trap that they use, you know, in exams a lot. And of course, this is a technique that needs a lot of practice within the class. 
constantly question yourself as regards the intentions of the author. An author might keep producing a text, an article, and at the end, he might blow our minds with an idea that he just threw out. I mean, we might be definitely sure that he's in favor of one situation, but at the end, after finishing, you know, the whole article uh, and, you know, closing his thoughts, we come to realize that, you know, he's thinking or talking about something else. So this is something that kids should practice in class when they're doing their practice tests. Always question what the author is trying to convey because he might, you know, be eluding us at any point throughout the article. Okay. Now, uh, before uh, closing off, I would like to thank you all for being here. I don't know if you have any questions. If not, um, our contact info is Betsy CLT. You can order our books online. Send us an email at orders at andrewbetsyselt.gr. Here are our phone numbers. It was a pleasure having you here today. Uh, I hope that we have a few questions that I can answer. I say I only have like two minutes left. And I wish you all a wonderful school year, full of imagination, creative thoughts. And of course, everyone, I wish you health and keep safe. Thank you for joining us. I'm Catherine. I hope to see you soon again. Goodbye, everyone.